<laughs> All right, so now we begin uh, apologetics. Let's go ahead and, and pray, and then we'll, we'll talk about what we're going to do. Now, Heavenly Father, we, um, we thank you for our time together today, and we thank you for the good time we had in the last class on logic. We pray that we will carry that forward here into apologetics. pray that you'll help us to be faithful uh, to your word in this class, and, and when we do it in real life, to defend the faith faithfully and, um, and do it well. I pray that you'll equip us to do that and to help us share the gospel with, uh, with people. And we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. All right, you guys have your Bibles? Okay, good. We're going to look at some various various passages uh, today. So, apologetics is the class we're, we're going through now. And as I've briefly mentioned to you all before, apologetics is the defense of the Christian worldview. Okay, that's what we're going to call it. The defense of the Christian worldview. So if you take your Bibles and turn to 1 Peter 3, um, this will be, this is one of the, the main texts. This is the text where we get the word apologetics from, 1 Peter 3, um, 15. So look over there. Would somebody read that, 1 Peter three fifteen? Yeah, I'm there. Thanks. <clears throat> but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Great, okay. There's a lot in this one verse that is so important to apologetics. Um, first, the word apologetics comes from the Greek word apologia, which is the word that's behind the English word uh, give a defense or make a defense there. Um, in verse 15, so we're, get, we're giving a defense to anyone who asks us for a reason for the hope that's within us, okay? So giving a verbal defense or an argument uh, defending the, the truth of it. So that's where the word apologetics comes from, from apologia right there for a verbal defense or a speech in defense. So we're making arguments, okay? Remember, we've talked about arguments and logic, right? What's an argument? What's the parts parts of the argument? Proposition and conclusion. Yeah, they're all they're all propositions. It's a, an argument is a series of propositions, and there's a conclusion, like you said, and then the other word is what? Premise. Premise. Yeah. yeah. So the so the the conclusion is the thing you're trying to prove, right? And then the premise is the supporting reasons for it. Okay, so what we're doing in apologetics is we're making an argument for the Christian worldview, and the conclusion is the Christian worldview is true. Okay, and then the premises is really what we're going to be going through basically is how that argument works. Now, that's maybe a simplistic way of putting it, what I just did, but that's kind of the goal. Um, it's not as simple as here's a quick little argument, premise one, premise two, conclusion, there's kind of more to it. But that's the idea. We're, we're trying to prove our conclusion, which is the Christian worldview is true. And that's what apologetics is about, is giving that defense. When somebody says, hey, Christianity is false because X, Y, and Z, we say, okay, here's our apologetic. Here's our defense of it, an argument against any objections. Okay, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. that's, that's really rather simple. That's what apologetics, uh, what it is, um, is giving, giving that, that defense. All right, good. All right, so notice that it says this. Give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that's within you. Okay? So what we're doing in apologetics here is we're going to be uh, equipping you to be able to give a defense to anyone, okay, who asks you for a reason. So whatever their worldview is. What are, what are, some, what are some worldviews that might come at Christianity that might attack us, our worldview, I mean? Atheist. Sure, Okay. This, will, this is going to help you answer atheists. What else? Like skeptics. Sure, and they may overlap. Likewise, it'll help you answer them. Who else? That's it. There's only atheists and skeptics <laughs> out there in the world. <laughs> I mean, all the other religions as well, like Buddhists. Mm -hmm. Hindus, yeah, Buddhism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Buddha, Buddhism, Hinduism, Scientology. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, right, um, Muslims, etc. Whatever you can think of, this, which is anything that's not Christianity, 
this is what we're supposed to be able to do according to First Peter three fifteen. Give an answer, make a defense of, for anyone who asks us for a reason, and they're going to come at us in different ways. An atheist is not going to argue the same way a Jehovah's Witness does. Totally different worldviews there, but they're both not really Christian, and we need to be able to give a defense to both. All right, so that's what we're going to do. That's this is our aim, right? And then notice what it says here. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. And this is vital here because there's a little bit of, there's a little bit of um, concern in my own heart when teaching apologetics to anybody because basically what we're going to do is we're gonna, I'm going to hand you serious weapons, verbal weapons, word weapons, okay? Things that, are, that can just totally destroy, honestly, totally destroy other worldviews. That's why Peter has to say, yeah, hold on. You're not just out there to decimate a person, right? You're going to you destroy their arguments, as we'll see in another text. But we're doing it in order to tear down their false worldview and then tell them the true worldview. Okay? So we have gentleness and respect. So our, so our demeanor when we're talking to a person is what? Gentle. That means they get, they get angry, they get flustered, they get attacking you. You don't. You don't go back at them with that. You keep your cool. Gentleness, respect, right? You're not engaging in name calling. You're not engaging in, remember, ad hominems, right, from logic. You're not engaging, hey, you're just an idiot, stuff like that. They might do that to you, and you gently and respectfully point out that that's not leg a legitimate thing <laughs> to call somebody an idiot in an argument, and you keep on going through giving a, a respectful argument, okay? Now, there are many ways that we can be respectful to our, our opponent, the person we're arguing with, um, one way is this, and I'll probably mention this later on as well, but I just, something that I've learned. You guys mentioned, for example, atheists. Okay. I said, we're going to be able to um, argue against atheists. Let me ask you a question. Say, say all of us talked to a different atheist, okay? Say, oh, say, say we came across 10 atheists or something, okay? Each one of those atheists, are they going to have the same arguments and the same exact worldview? No, they're not. So if we say, okay, I know how to deal with atheists. This person's an atheist. Therefore, I know exactly what they're going to say. I know exactly what they believe. Well, you don't. If they say they're an atheist, you know one thing about them. They don't believe there's a God. Okay, That's, that's an important aspect to their worldview, but they may have totally different arguments than the next atheist you talk to. So it's part of respecting them is asking, okay, let's ask questions, figure out what they actually believe, what this person believes. Because apologetics is not dealing with some gen generic worldview category of atheists or Jehovah's Witnesses or whatever, it's dealing with the person you're talking to in their worldview, which may fit in that category of an atheistic worldview, a humanistic worldview or whatever, but you need to find out what this person believes. And in fact, it's really not that hard to do that, and we'll cover that in this class, how we can figure out what they believe, ask them certain questions. All right, does that make sense? So gentleness and respect, um, he's telling us particularly, you're arguing but you're going to do it gent with gentleness and respect when you're talking to the person. Let me ask you a question. Does this mean that you respect their worldview? What do you guys think? No. No. Of course not. The worldview is false. It's a, it's a lying worldview. You don't, it doesn't, it, you're, not doing, you're not respecting their worldview. You're arguing with the person with gentleness and respect. You're giving a defense with gentleness and respect is what he's saying. In fact, as we'll see here in a little bit, the Apostle Paul has zero respect for unbelieving worldviews. Absolutely none. In fact, the Bible as a whole uh, gives no positive things about unbelieving worldviews. But we need to be kind, you know, gentle, respectful to the person we're talking to. That's the, the way that we're supposed to act. Um, this is what, uh, what Greg Bonson said. Greg Bonson is a really important person um, when it comes to apologetics. In fact, this book written by Jason Lyle that you're using if you look in the front, it's dedicated to Greg Bonson. Uh, because Greg Bonson, he died in 1995. He died pretty young. He was 46 because he had heart issues, health issues. But he is really, really important to the type of apologetics that I'll be teaching you. Um, I'm indebted to him. Jason Lyle's indebted to him. In fact, a anybody who, who does this apologetics that I'm teaching you is indebted to him, basically. Okay? Um, he was taught, Greg Bonson was taught by a guy named Cornelius Van Til. Okay? He was a Dutch theologian philosopher guy. He, he's the one who really developed this apologetics, but Greg Bonson took that 
and spread it around and wrote a bunch of stuff and all that. And that's why, for example, Jason Lyle dedicated this book to Greg Bonson. So Greg Bonson says this about 1 Peter 3.15. He says, this. he says, when we begin to use our intellects in the service of our creator and savior, we will naturally wish to do so with the best efforts and quality available. I hope that's true. That when you say, okay, I want to use my brain, my mind, to, for, for the sake of Jesus and, and argue in defense of the Christian worldview, I hope you want to do it the best possible way, right? And not just give some shoddy efforts, right? He says, it's obvious in the pages of the New Testament that this was the case for the disciples, whether they were fishermen, tax collectors, or studious teachers of the law. Who are, who are some fishermen of Jesus' disciples? Peter. Yeah, okay. Who, were tax, who was a tax collector? Matthew. Yeah, and who was a studious teacher of the law? Ooh, Paul. Yes, very good. So that's who you're referring to. Paul was, uh, had a brilliant intellect um, and was very studious. Studied under, here's a, here's a Bible trivia question. Who did he study under? Paul, or Saul of Tarsus before he was Paul. This is a, this is a, a detailed one. Gamaliel. Yeah. Gamaliel. All right. Let me see. Real quick. Yeah. Um, every day. So. Let me see. Sorry, one second. Yeah. This is, this is in various places. Uh, Acts 22.3, though, Paul says, I am a Jew, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, brought up in this city, educated under Gamaliel, strictly according to the law of our fathers, etc. So anyway, that's where that is. All right, so that's to whatever, whatever, whatever their background was, they all wanted to do apologetics well. It says, they put their minds to work, searching God's word for better understanding and reasoning with people to persuade them of its truth. Yet they knew the difference between intellectual argument which is what the pre presentation of premises or reasons in support of an inference or a conclusion, right? An argument. They knew the difference between an, a logical argument, the offering of evidence to substantiate claims, and the interpersonal spirit of hostility or contention. In other words, there's a difference between a logical argument and fighting with somebody, okay? That's what he's saying. And that's what we're supposed to recognize here, what Peter's telling us. We're not going to be hostile in our demeanor towards people. So he says, thus Peter, aware of different ways, aware of different ways an argument can be conducted, specifically reminded his readers to offer their reason defense with gentleness and respect. Paul wrote, the Lord's bondservant must not quarrel, but be gentle toward all, able to teach, forbearing or patient, in meekness correcting those who oppose themselves. Okay, so in gentleness correcting the opposition. You can do that, right? A lot of times in our culture you have this kind of macho like like, I'm going to pound my chest, pound the table, like, you're going to agree with me, or I'm going to, you know. And that's not how we're supposed to be. We're supposed to reason. We're supposed to reason. Okay? We're supposed to use logical argumentation with gentleness and respect. That doesn't mean our argumentation pulls punches. It doesn't. Our argumentation is going to be devastating. But it's going to be done with gentleness and respect. Okay? And that's the, that's the, the balance we're trying to have here. Which is what he says next. This does not mean even giving an inch on the issues of truth over which we disagree with the unbeliever. But it does mean, as Dr. Van Til, that's his, you know, the guy who taught him, Cornelius Van Til, as Dr. Van Til would always say, that we keep buying the next cup of coffee for our opponent. And the point is there is that you're treating them well, no matter what. Okay? Even though you're destroying their worldview, arguing with them, even if they get flustered or whatever, you're still being kind to them. Right? And that's, that's kind of the first thing we need to get on, on, in our heads here. We're going to be arguing, logically arguing, using logical argumentation, but we're not going to be rude. Let's sum it up. Does that make sense? You guys follow that? Okay. Not too hard, but that's important to remember. Because, like I said, when we get through this, if you understand the argumentation that we do in this class, it's, it's, it really is a life-changing thing. It has been for me, and, and I think for most people it is when they really get it. And you can destroy anything. It's really, really cool <laughs> that all these worldviews that are out there, it doesn't matter because you can still do it. All right, so that's 1 Peter 3.15 in a nutshell for now. Look at 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5. Would somebody read that? 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5. 
For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that it sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Thank you. So he's saying we're not fighting with physical weapons here. We're not getting our swords out or our guns out, right? He's saying well, weapons of the warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We what? Verse 5, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. This is really important. We are dealing, anything that, that, that contradicts the truth of God's word, we destroy it. The argumentation. We destroy their arguments. Every opinion, everything like that, every every argument that raises itself against the knowledge of God, we destroy with argumentation. And what it says, we take every thought captive to obey Christ. You guys remember, what's the first and greatest commandment according to Jesus? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, body, mind, soul, and strength. Mm-hmm. So, that's right. So, one of the things there is loving God with all of your mind. Okay, all of your mind. And basically what that, what that commandment is, is loving God with all that's within you. Everything that you are is to love God. So that's what the, the point is. But mind is part of it. And that's similar to here. We take every thought captive to obey Christ. If all of our way of thinking needs to be molded and formed by God's word. It's not, it's not our own made up ideas or our imaginations or whatever. We don't get to have our own lofty opinion raised against God's word and say, well, yeah, God's word says that, but we say this, and we're right. Now, that's the type of stuff we're supposed to be arguing against. And we take every thought captive to obedience to Christ, to his word. So we, we form our minds around God's word. As it's been said, we think God's thoughts after him. What that means is that God says something, here's his thoughts, and then we think the same thing after. We learn that from him, okay? And that's what we're supposed to do. Does that make sense? That's really vital for your life, period. I mean, that's like a huge life lesson by itself, okay, is that you don't, we, we as people, as humans, are very limited in every way, okay, including our knowledge, including our ability to discern things, and including our wisdom. We don't have it in and of ourselves. God gives us his words so that we can have it, okay, so we can learn it, learn wisdom, knowledge, and all that. So... That's important. We have to have that humility and also say, yeah, I'm, it's not my ideas that I'm defending. Ultimately, I'm defending what God has laid down as ultimate truth. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay, one more. Jude, verse 3. It's only one chapter in Jude, so it's Jude, verse 3. Will somebody read that? the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to God's holy people. Thank you. Yeah. So and that's what he's saying. He's saying, I really would have liked to talk to you about the gospel and things of pertaining to salvation, but I found it necessary to, to urge you, to appeal to you, to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Okay. To contend. What's it mean to contend? Any ideas? Basically, it means to defend, to fight for, um, to fight for the faith. In other words, what, what's going on in Jude is that you have false teachers who are coming in, and he's like, you need to defend against these, these guys, um, to fight for it, right? So he's saying, I would like to have talked about that, but it's necessary because of these false teachers to tell you to defend the faith, Okay to contend for it, to fight for it against the false teachers, false teachings, um, which was once for all handed down to the saints. And what he's referring to there is that you have this one central, yeah, well, you have one um, truth in God's word, one gospel. He's saying, this is the message that's carried down to you. You defend that. It's not something that's ever changing, thankfully. Um, God's word is a fixed standard. You'll notice it's not, it's not changing from year to year, right? It's the same 
right? And that's because why is that? Why does God's word not change? Why why doesn't he why doesn't he change his mind and just go back on what he said? God just doesn't change at all. Period. There you go. Yeah, he doesn't change. Remember this great verse from Hebrews, right? Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, or forever. And um, that is a good verse for that, is that he's always the same. There's many other verses that say God doesn't change. All right, so what, basically what we've just seen is that we're supposed to defend the faith. We're supposed to destroy arguments, make a defense, contend for the faith, all of that. It's a command from God. That we do that in, in these three verses that we looked at. First Peter 3, 15, Second Peter, or Second Corinthians um, 10, 5, and Jude verse 3. So we gotta do it. Okay? We gotta be able to do it. We gotta strive for it. And that's why we have this class. As we're here to try to learn how to fight for the faith or defend the faith. Okay? Any questions so far? That's kind of point one. What's apologetics? Yeah. Why are we supposed to do it? God says so. Yeah. That's pretty simple. And what should our demeanor be? Defend with warm respect. Yes. Very good. Okay. All right, good. So moving on, we need to talk about this. This is really important. Every, everything that I'm teaching you that's going to be foundational, it all has a purpose, okay? So everything, it all is going to build on itself, and then we'll, then we'll eventually get to, like, the real practical, on the street, you're talking to some random person and dealing with their arguments. But we're gonna, we have to build a foundation first. So next, I want to talk about um, what God says about unbelieving worldviews. Okay, this is really important. First of all, what is a worldview? It's like how you view everything, like the thing that's like, central to how you interpret and view things. Yes. Uh, good. Very good. It's, it's, it's the, the way by which you interpret all information. That's, I think, yeah, you're basically saying that. And remember, we talked about it as if it's a lens, right? It's a thing like in glasses where everything is filtered through that. And depending on how accurate your lens is, uh, is going to make all the difference, right? So if your worldview is a false worldview, it's a distorted lens, you're going to come away with wrong interpretations of information. That makes sense? So, like I said, if you have red lenses in your glasses and you look at everything in the world, you're going to think it's all shades of red. But that would be a, fault, a faulty conclusion because your lenses are filtering it wrong, right? What we're saying is the Christian worldview is the only pure, true, crystal clear, accurate worldview that actually makes sense out of the world in a proper way. Because God has given us truth. He's given us propositional truth. He's told us this is the case in the Bible. This is the truth. And because of that, if you form your mind around that, what God's word says about stuff, then you can have a proper understanding of the world. Okay. We'll talk about worldviews more in detail later, but it deals with what you think is reality. Is there a spiritual aspect to reality, or is it just physical, for example? From a Christian worldview, what's the answer to that question? There's a spiritual too. Yeah. Right, okay. But if you're a naturalist, they would say, no, it's just physical. Okay, there's a difference. So worldviews deal with what's reality. They deal with ethics, what's right and wrong. Where do we get our ethics from? Oh. Right. Where does an atheist get his from? Where? Yeah, very, various <laughs> answers to that question, but not from the Bible, obviously. Right, so that's that's another example. Ethics, and then um, how we know what we know. It's called epistemology. We'll talk about that in detail later. But how we know things, okay? So that's that's an important aspect. How do we have knowledge, um, our theory of knowledge, things like that? So those those are what the specifics of a worldview. But how we understand the world um, is is the, our worldview is how we interpret data or pieces of information, um, and our and, and what our worldview is will determine whether or not. We're right about that. All right, so this, what we're going to look at is a bunch of scriptures about God's, what he says about unbelieving worldviews or non-Christian worldviews, right? Look at somebody, let's all look at 1 Corinthians 1, okay? 1 Corinthians 1, 18.
I'll read this one. We're going to read 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 25 here. All right, 1 Corinthians 1, 18. This is a really important passage, like a really important passage for our apologetics. Um, so remember this one, okay, because this is important. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 25. He says, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. i right, stop there. What's the word of the cross refer to? What's he mean by that? The gospel. The gospel, yeah. The message of the cross is the message that Jesus died on the cross to save us from our sins, to save us from the wrath of God, etc. What's folly mean? Foolishness. foolishness. All right. So the gospel, in other words, the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing, guys, to those who will not believe, those who are not saved. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. Okay, so when it comes to the gospel, there's two different responses to it. Either you reject it or you don't, all right? You reject it or you accept it. If you reject it, it's foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, they recognize it's the power of God for salvation. Right? Same message, two different views of it, right? And there's a quotation here in verse 19 uh, from Isaiah. He says, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. That's God talking. Now, what's he talking about? Let's keep reading and we'll get a better idea. Verse 20. Paul says, Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Okay, notice that. So verse 19 is from Isaiah. He's saying, God, God says he'll destroy the, and if we could do this, the wisdom, quote unquote, wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning, I will thwart. What he's saying is God has shown the so-called wisdom of the world to be foolishness. Verse 20, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? You have this kind of funny thing in verse 20 where Paul is issuing these challenges. Hey, where is, this, where is the wise one? Bring it on. Where's the scribe? Come on over. Where's the debater of this age? You know, step into the ring. We'll fight. Arguments, right? We'll debate. Where's the debater? Bring it on. Because God has made foolish the wisdom of the world. Nothing to worry about here. They, what, what the world claims to be wise, he's saying it's foolishness. Which is what Isaiah is saying. God says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. And the discernment of the discerning, I will thwart. So verse 21, he says, For since, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Now let's break that down. So in the wisdom of God, that is the true wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. What that means is through the world's wisdom. How, how is it that somebody comes to truly know God in a saving way? What do they need to really believe in Jesus and be saved? Can they just sit somewhere and just really think about it and look up at the stars and look at the trees and then come to a knowledge that Jesus died on the cross? No. How, what, do they, what do they need then? I guess someone to tell them. Tell them the word of the cross, right? To tell them the gospel. So the world through its wisdom, that is its so-called wisdom, what it claims to be wisdom, with its own philosophies, its own worldviews, it will never come to know God if it, if it rests on its own understanding. If an unbelieving worldview follows its own wisdom, it will not come to know God. People come to know God, what? Through the foolishness, what people consider to be foolishness, of what we preach. See, the message of the cross, the gospel, to save those who believe. God, God used what the world considers to be foolish to save. See, there's a kind of a great reversal theme in this passage. The, the world claims to be wise. God says, no, it's foolishness. And the world thinks God's word is foolish, but God says, no, it's actually wisdom. Because God has made foolish the wisdom of the world. Right? So for since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. That is, unbelieving worldviews will never come to know God on their own worldviews. They have to go to, the, to God's word and ultimately just change their worldview. They have to, be, they have to adopt a Christian worldview. Um, 
For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. He says, for the Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, worldly wisdom, right? But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. What a great verse. Let me ask you a question. It says, for the foolishness of God is wiser than men. Is there foolishness in God? None whatsoever, right? So, what's he doing? What's he mean by that? The foolishness of God is wiser than men? I guess like what he's trying to say is like no matter like how wise you are, you're still not gonna get anywhere close to God's standard. Yeah, he he's using um, a figure of speech, it's hyperbole, right? You know, that is exaggerating to make a point. He's saying if God could be foolish, which he can't, but even if God could be foolish, it'd still be wiser than all of man's worldies. The foolishness of God is wiser than men. Even if God could be foolish, it'd still be wiser. And he says, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Again, can God be weak? No. But again, if he could be weak, he'd still be stronger than everybody put together. See his point there? There is no, not, it's not even close. When it comes to unbelieving worldviews, they're not like doing really, really well. They just need a little bit of guidance. Is that he's calling it foolishness. He's saying it's devoid of real wisdom, real knowledge. Because God has made foolish the wisdom of the world. He's shown it to be what it really is. Okay, this is really important to apologetics. You need to understand that when you're dealing with unbelieving worldviews, you're not dealing with something that's pretty close, that just needs a little Jesus added to it. You're dealing with fundamentally different foundations here. Okay, fundamentally different foundations. And we'll see that as we go, I think, more clearly. But the thing is, what is the foundation for the Christian worldview? What do we base everything on? Wow. Right. Do, un- what, do unbelieving worldviews base their worldview on the Bible? No, they don't. That's one thing they all have in common, okay? Now, let me, a little side note. There are some worldviews that will claim to do that. Okay, but that's a different issue. Whether in reality they're doing that or not um, is, the, is the real issue. So the point is, you have different foundations. Some will, will take the Bible as God's word, others will not. And basically what we're saying here is if you don't, if you don't accept the message preached here, as he's talking about the word of the cross, then he's saying that's foolishness if you don't accept that. You're, you're in the category of foolish worldviews. But the wisdom of God is in Christ. Look at verse 24, remember? The last part, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Okay. So this is really important. Our main point here in this verse is that God has declared unbelieving worldviews to be foolish. Not kind of wise. Okay? They're foolish. Wisdom is found in, in Christ. Um, so, on that same theme, let's look up some different verses. Let's go to the book of Proverbs. Some of you read Proverbs 1 7. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Okay, so what, is the, what does that mean to fear the Lord? This is all over the Bible. So what's it mean? It's like a respect, right? Mm-hmm. Very important. Remember we talked about how words have multiple meanings, right? Now, fear is no different. Fear has multiple meanings. It can mean I'm terrified, scared of, right? Which um, is, used, is used that way in the Bible in very, various places. It also can mean a, rever- a profound reverence or respect. And in this, in this context, that's what it means, a profound reverence and respect. Um, for example, if you're a Christian, if you're saved from the punishment due to your sins, should you fear condemnation from God? Should, should you fear to go to hell? No, you should not. Uh, because, because that's why Jesus said, he, he, you know, his, his Romans 8, 1, um, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? So, but you should fear the Lord in this sense, in a profound reverence and respect for his holiness, for who he is, what he's done, etc. And what he's saying here is this. If you, don't, if you don't start with respecting God and listening to his word and submitting your life to him, 
then you'll never even get on the path to, to true knowledge and wisdom. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of it, of knowledge. Fools, dis- here's, the, here's the contrast. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. You ever heard of a, of a, a parallelism? Ever heard of that? They're all over the Old Testament in particular in, in poetic sections like Proverbs. Proverbs is full of parallelisms. There's different kinds. Here's what's called a contrasting parallelism. The first line says something. The second line says something that is related to it, but kind of opposite or contrasting to it. That's what we have here. Line one is, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you start with reverence for God, you are on the path to gaining true knowledge. If, on the other hand, contrasting, you are you're one who despises the wisdom of God, despises instruction from God, then you are a fool. Because fools despise wisdom and instruction. So where are we going to start? We're talking about starting points here, foundations here. If your foundation is the fear of the Lord, that means you, you receive his word and submit to it. And you're, on, you're, you're able to have knowledge and wisdom. If you won't start there, if you will not heed God's word, then you won't. You're a fool. Just like Paul says in 1 Corinthians, Proverbs says the same thing. Does that make sense? Let's see it again. Proverbs 9. Look over Proverbs 9, 10. Somebody read that one as well. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. All right, very similar verse, isn't it? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom this time. That one was knowledge, now it says wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Now, this is a parallelism where they're synonymous, meaning they're saying essentially the same thing in the second line. The knowledge of the Holy One is insight. You want to have real insight, real knowledge, real wisdom? It starts with really knowing God, really reverencing Him. If you, won't, if you won't receive his word, the Bible, then you won't have wisdom and knowledge according to these passages. Proverbs as well as 1 Corinthians. Um, look over at Proverbs 28, 26. Proverbs 28, 26. Somebody read that. He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool, but whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. Okay, notice that first line. Whoever trusts in his own mind is a fool. Okay, so trusting in yourself, trusting in your own intellect by itself, or if your own unbel- like non-Christian worldview, for example, it, it, it leads, it's foolishness, like all these other verses say. But he who walks in wisdom will be delivered. How, how does somebody walk in wisdom? What's the starting point? Through the Lord. Through the Lord. Right. Okay. Um, let's see. Look at Proverbs. Uh, Proverbs twenty six, four and five. I'll read this one. We'll talk about this one later on again, but this is just for introductory purposes. Proverbs twenty six, four and five. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Now, at first glance, you say, wait a second. It says, answer not a fool according to his folly. And it says, answer a fool according to his folly. Wait a second. Is that a contradiction? No. It, what it's talking about here is, is different ways you handle arguing with the fool. Okay, so answer not a fool according to his folly or his foolishness, lest you be like him yourself. This is important. What does that mean? If you will, if you're going to answer, if you're going to argue with a fool, he's saying, don't, don't act like him in the sense that you're, you're going to adopt, you're going to set aside the Bible in your argumentation. You're going to abandon your Christian worldview foundation and argue like an unbeliever and say, well, let's just be neutral. Let's just argue neutrally. Okay, we're just going to argue simply based upon... Um, attempting to argue based upon not, something other than the Bible. He's saying if you do that, you're basically adopting an unbelieving worldview and you're becoming like him, foolish. You're becoming foolish like him. You're, if, you, if, you, if you stick with the Christian worldview and you stick with the Bible, you're able to have knowledge and wisdom. If you set it aside, 
You're just like them, believer now. In your argumentation, you both have nothing to stand on. We'll talk about that more later, because that's you need to understand more before that will really hit you. But then it says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. And what that means is, don't let him, um, don't let him think that his worldview has any leg to stand on. Don't let him think that he has wisdom in his worldview. Don't let him be wise in his own eyes. He goes, well, I, I get it. I, I understand the world. My worldview is right. No, we need to destroy the arguments and show the worldview to be foolish, like it actually is, because God has made foolish the wisdom of the world. So when we do apologetics, we can say it this way. We're going to show the unbeliever that his worldview is foolish. That's really part of the goal. Okay? So he's not wise in his own eyes anymore. And the reason for that is so that you can go in and bring in the uh, true worldview. All right, Proverbs 21.30. Will somebody get that? Right, so there's no wisdom, no understanding, no counsel that can avail against the Lord. Again, the same idea, really, is that there's no, there's no arguments, no worldviews, no nothing that can really stand up against the truth of God's word. It's like Paul saying, where's the debater of this age? Bring it on. There's nothing that can stand up against the wisdom of God and his word. That's what we're going to do in our argument. So nothing, nothing that unbelieving worldviews come up with is ever true knowledge. Okay. Um, 1 Timothy 6, 20 and 21. Somebody get that? Um, 6, 20, and 21. Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Turn away from the godless chatter and the opposing ideas of what is falsely called knowledge, which some have professed, to, which some have professed and in doing so have departed from the faith. Grace be with you all. Great, okay. So, he's saying, Timothy, guard the doctrines that you've been given. Guard the teachings that you've been given. Okay? And avoid, this is important, irre- the irreverent babble and contradictions of what is falsely called knowledge. When you guys did your worldview course recently, you, get, you talked about antithesis, didn't you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. The word behind contradictions there or opposing arguments is antithesis in Greek. Okay? Um, you have your thesis, you have your antithesis, okay? And that's what you have here. You're saying avoid the, contradi- the things that contradict. Um, the pe- people who, who say that they have knowledge, but their arguments are contradictory, he says that's irreverent babble, and it's contradictory. Avoid it. It's falsely called knowledge. Notice that? Isn't that cool? He says that's fake knowledge. They claim it's knowledge, but it's not, because it's contradictory. It's irreverent babble. It's not true. And he says, for by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. So some have been taken in by this false stuff that doesn't make sense, but people are taken in by it. Remember, people are often persuaded by fallacious reasoning, unfortunately. People are often persuaded by fallacies. He's saying, avoid that stuff. Look out for it. Watch out for it. It's false knowledge. Do you hear that? Make sense? Okay. So there's people claiming to be wise, but are actually foolish. That's what you have with unbelieving worldviews. Are we gonna? God, God has declared his verdict on unbelieving worldviews, and he's saying they're false. They're foolish. They don't have anything to stand on. They have no foundation. Does that make sense? It's important that we get this, okay? Because we need to know what we're dealing with here. Is that God has said these things, and they're they're not the unbeliever is not doing pretty good in his worldview. And he has like a good amount of wisdom, he just needs a little bit of help. It's that there's if he doesn't start with the fear of the Lord, he's not even on the on the pathway to getting true wisdom and true knowledge. Remember first Corinthians, he says, um, th- the world does not know God through wisdom, through its own wisdom. It can't. 
So how do we know God? It all comes back to his revealed word in scripture. That's absolutely foundational to knowing, to knowing him and therefore, therefore knowing the truth. Okay. Um, for example, just to side note, we'll talk about this plenty in this class, but how do you know that it's wrong to murder somebody? Right, because God has revealed that in his word. Can you, can you think of an answer that if you don't start with God's word, if you, don't, if you reject it, you say, no Bible, we can't use the Bible. How can you answer the question? It's just whatever you think. It's not really like that. So why? So say somebody say say you know somebody believes it's wrong to murder, and you say, well, why? I've heard the argument that like it goes back to when we were like like whatever like apes or whatever, mm-hmm. like the the tribe mentality, like you do what's best for the tribe in order to succeed. So it's like if you start murdering your own tribe members, like that would be that would be not good for your being. So it's, but basically, they they argue like an instinctual thing. Like it's mm-hmm. an instinct that you don't murder people. Well, there's a few problems with that. Do people murder others? Yeah. Okay. So it's not like a, a hard and fast rule um, that we all just follow. Secondly, that begs the question: Why is it wrong to murder? Because it's best not to. Remember begging the question: arbitrariness, circular reasoning. Well, it's not, it's, it doesn't, it's not advantageous for us to do it. In other words, it's better not to. Well, why? How can you, what if I say, no, I think it's advantageous if I kill some of you? How can you argue against it? Without being arbitrary, right? Uh-oh, okay. So are we finding some foolishness and claiming things are wrong without the Bible as the foundation? You haven't have a reason yet? We'll talk, there's plenty, of, you haven't thought of any, but there's plenty, many, but there are plenty of arguments people will make and none of them work. We'll go through them later in this class um, for, for ethics. But people, everybody, whatever their worldview is, they think things are right and wrong, right? Don't they? Mm-hmm. People will always say something, they'll always be like, that's wrong. Why? And then wait for arbitrariness and inconsistency to fly out of their mouth. Okay, but when it comes to when it comes to Christian worldview, it was easy. Well, God says, I can know that because God has revealed in His Word, Ten Commandments, for example. He said, "I shall not murder." Okay, great, easy, simple. We could talk about it more, but we have that foundation to make sense out of ethics, not just murder, but all of all ethical issues. So if you don't start there. You start, you start immediately showing the foolishness of unbelief. And that's my point here. The foolishness of unbelief. You don't believe God's word. You, you, what you believe is ultimately arbitrary. We talk about ethics. What you believe about ethics is arbitrary, for example. Just believe it for, for no reason, for no, no real reason. That make sense? Cool. All right. Look at, with me at, at one more verse, um, Colossians 2. I want you to turn there with me. Colossians 2, um, 1 to 10. This is a really important passage as well. Where is, so if knowledge is not found in unbelieving worldviews, because it's foolishness, where is knowledge found? Well, you know the answer to that in, in the Christian worldview. Let's get specific, though. This, this text will answer for us where wisdom and knowledge is found. Will somebody read for us Colossians 2, 1 to 10, please? I can. Thank you. I want you to know how hard I am contending for you and for those in Laodicea and for all who have not met me personally. My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and unite in love so that so that they may have full riches and complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom we are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit, and delight to see how disciplined you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, 
and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through a hollow and deceptive philosophy which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world, rather than on Christ. For in Christ the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. Right. So, there's a few few things here that we want to emphasize. All right. So, looking at verse, the last part of verse 2 and verse 3 says that in Christ, or the, the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You need to know that. Where are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge found? In Christ. Not outside of him. You get the point? Mm -hmm. Unbelieving worldviews don't have Christ, therefore they don't have wisdom and knowledge. In Christ are found all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, and treasures they are, and nobody has a right to them unless they're in Christ. Now, why does he say this? Why does he say this? Look at verse 4. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. Is anybody saying that? This is really, really, really relevant to apologetics. You need to know that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are in Christ so that you're not thinking, well, it's unbelieving worldview. I mean, it sounds kind of wise. It sounds like it has knowledge in it. He's saying, no, you don't want to be deluded by, by arguments that sound pretty good, but in reality are devoid of wisdom and knowledge. Okay, fallacious arguments, arguments that are not rooted in the truth. They have a facade of the truth. They pretend. It's falsely called knowledge. But in reality, it's the irreverent babble and contradictions that Paul is telling Timothy about. So he's saying, I say that you need to know where wisdom and knowledge are found so that you won't be deluded with plausible arguments. Okay. Look, at, look down at verse uh, 6. He says, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Notice verse 8. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. So he's saying, don't be taken captive by philosophies that are of human tradition. Okay? They're empty, it's empty deceit according to the elementary principles of the world, he's saying. The ones that are not according to Christ. So he says up here in verse 3 and 4, Wisdom and knowledge is in Christ. So later on he says, don't be taken in by philosophies, by worldviews that don't have Christ, that aren't Christian, that aren't Christ's philosophy, that aren't Christ's worldview. So don't be taken in by that. So he's saying, I want you to not be taken in by plausible arguments, arguments that sound good. See to it that no one takes you captive by these, these clever arguments, but are really not founded on God's word. If they're founded on God's word in truth, that is, that's a correct interpretation of God's word, then it's good. But if it's a perversion of God's word or if it's founded on something else, a perversion of God's word is not God's word either. So ultimately, if all that's not God's word, it's on something else, then it's bad. Then it's false, and we should not be taken captive by it. So where is knowledge found? In Christ. In Christ and not outside of him. So all of these verses are really saying one basic thing. In Christ is where truth is, where knowledge and wisdom are. Outside of him is foolishness. So worldviews that don't have Christ, they don't have the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And we need to show them that. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to show them, hey, your worldview is devoid of truth. You can prop it up to make it look good, but ultimately it's, it's not. There's nothing there to it. There's no substance to it. I mean, there's more answers that people could give about ethics, but I think hopefully I illustrated it to you already. Asking a simple question, most people you talk to will say that murder is wrong. But can they give an answer that's not fallacious? It doesn't beg the question. It's not arbitrary or inconsistent. It's a pretty basic question. Ethics, kind of, everybody makes ethical decisions. Why are you opposed to school shootings? Well, we can answer that really easily because it's evil. Because God has said it's wrong to murder. Again, he said it's wrong to murder. But for an unbelieving worldview, they will say most of the time it's wrong to do that, but have no reason to believe it. 
we'll talk again. We'll talk about that more later on as we go through the class. But that's an example of the foolishness that's found in unbelievable worldviews. It can't even make sense out of basic stuff like that. Okay. Are there any questions about what we've covered so far? So what's apologetics? Okay. And what's the what's God's verdict on unbelieving worldviews? What about the what about Christian worldview? Wise, right? Has wisdom and knowledge. All right, good. All right, um, let's go ahead and uh, take a break then, and we'll come back at let's say ten fifteen.